Well, let me ask you a question, I guess, here from the beginning. And this is something I want to kind of just go around your brain, kind of resonate with you for a while, just to think about this for a while. Uh, and I'll put this up here really on, on the screens here. Is life with Jesus worth giving up everything for? That's what I want you to just be thinking about this whole time. And after this day, this, is, this kind of goes with our series, what we've been going through, and this we're talking about the church, and really it, it is. I want us to examine that. Like, what is the church all about? That's what we've been doing in this series. What are we really doing here? What is the point of this? I want us to examine like, what, why we're doing this and that, uh, that it's not just, not just a routine that we come here and all this. And so that, that's kind of with that question. I've asked you in different ways and, and other questions throughout this series, but I want you to think about that today. Is life with Jesus worth giving up everything for? And don't just come up with a, just a quick answer. Don't just, just, yeah. And really, I would encourage you not to go to those answers that are, are really kind of wishy-washy. Like, I mean, maybe, uh, you know, I, I think so, or I, I haven't really come to an answer. I want you to think about that. And, and throughout this whole time, and, and just as a Christian, I, I think we need to examine that, think about that in our life. Is, is, is living for Jesus worth giving up everything for? Because I think that's what he's asking for here. It, it will shape everything about how you live and what you do and the decisions we make. We've been talking about that even. It, shapes, it should shape the way that we live, how we answer that question. Um, and, and it's just so important for us. So with that, as we're talking about that, I do have a couple questions. I won't put these up on the screen, but this is what I'm going to be talking about here today uh, with this uh, as we're thinking about that question. Two things I want to talk about. Suffering as being a Christian and, and just a little bit at the end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention on this, we could do a whole series on this, but just evil in the world. I, I'm going to kind of hint at that a little bit at the end there, but I want to talk about that, suffering as a Christian, and then, and then with that, some of the questions we have uh, with evil and all this stuff. So I, I want to go on that. This is something, those are things I believe we'll talk about a whole lot just in church throughout time, the life of the church and all just in our lives. It's something we've got to wrestle with because it's what we deal with and it's tough, it's difficult. And, and just, I would say, even as Christians, sometimes if someone's asking you uh, that's coming into the church, maybe there's some here and that way, it's like you're, you're examining God and all that. That's questions that's, that's going to come up over and over again. And, and I believe we need some answers to that. We, we need to be able to, to talk about that or just answer that for ourselves and, and so often. And, and so we'll look at different scriptures here. And just, just by the way, with that, like, what we're going to do, we'll go through this, we'll look at Scripture, and really we're just left with the idea of we're accepted or, or rejected. I, I mean, that's, to me, that's, that's the Bible. It's like, we just come to this, and it's like, here's what it says. That's what we need to be doing. We need to go to this and just examine it, look at it, and it's like, we're just left with, at the end, are we going to accept this, or are we going to reject that? And, and so, uh, again, just some... Bible understanding here is the more, I think the more scripture you have, the more you go in there, the harder it is to be able to really reject a lot of stuff from God. The, the less scripture you have, the more things, you, you can make it say what you want, the, the less scripture you have. I just want to tell you in that, especially maybe in your own Bible study in your life and as you're examining things as a Christian, it's like, as you look in here, even if you're, you're not a Christian, you're just trying to examine this, the less scripture you have, you can make it say whatever you want. You, you can make it do whatever you want and just, just turn it around and you can, you can form whatever beliefs that you want. That's why there's, there's cults and there's different uh, religions in the world that can do that. But the more scripture we have, the more we're, we're kind of confined to the truth, you know, which is, which is where we want to be just up front. That's where I'm going. I, I want to find the truth and I want to put that out there. So it's like the more scripture I think we have. Anyway, just some, just some stuff there for, I guess, for us to, to know about that simple stuff there. So here's what I'm, I, I want to read this, this scripture here in Matthew 10. I'm going to start off with this today. I go to this a lot. This is a passage I'll go to Christians, non-Christians, and, and, and I'll, I'll tell them, like, this is what it means. This is what he, he, he's calling us, this, this very deep commitment to him. And I, and I go to that because I don't want us to, to be uh, tricked in any way, thinking that like it's, it's easy coming to follow Christ and nothing's ever going to come at you. And so I, I go to these passages really for a reason, because I, I want us, I, I think it's, it's really hard to misinterpret what, what Christ is trying to say when we go to some of these passages. So this is what I read, Matthew 10, 37 through 39. Tough passages, but we'll talk about this. He says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. It's, it's, it's tough stuff in there. You know, it's, it's like, it, you just, if you love anything else more than him, it's like you can't even love your mama 
more than him. I mean, that's what he's saying. He's going there. Your whole family, all these things, he says, you can't love him more than me. That's what he's saying. And if you want to go to even more controversial passage, you can go to Luke chapter 14. That's another one that I talked to because in there it talks about, he says, if you want to be my disciple, he says, anyone who doesn't hate their father, mother, son, daughter, yes, even their own life can't be my disciple. I mean, that's extreme really right there and what he's talking about. I think Matthew maybe gives a little more clarity really what he's talking about there. Jesus, let me say this up here because I don't want to confuse anybody. Jesus is, is never teaching hate. He's not teaching that anyway. In fact, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 5, 6, and 7, we see this is his Sermon on the Mount. He talks about loving our enemies. So we're not to hate anybody in, that, in any possible way. Wait till the end because I'll get off. Uh, he, he, just, he doesn't ask us to hate anybody in any possible way. So he's going in there and he talks about like loving our enemies. And so, so he's, not, he's not having some extreme thing here where he's saying, okay, uh, you need to hate your family, but you got to go love your enemies. Don't get confused on that. He's saying to, to absolutely love everybody. That's what he's talking about in there. But he goes to an extreme here. I, I think this is what I think about with our families. Sometimes our families... I don't know if you've been there with this, but with your family, you're like, if you have uh, siblings or just, you know, your parents or your cousins, you know, family, close members, you, you say, okay, yeah, I can fight with them. Maybe, maybe people come up to you and you're like, why do you guys fight all the time? You're like, oh, it's, it's love. It's just what we do. And like, I can fight with them. We can do this and that's okay. But if anybody else comes to my family, anybody else comes to them, they have no right because they're not my family. You know, anybody else comes, like, it's on. You know, I, I don't know if you're that way, like with family, like you cannot do that. You, you get like, you know, just like the side eye, like crooked face. I don't know what it is. Like you get crazy, you know, the crazy eyes and all that. Like this is my family. Nobody can do this. We can fight. That's okay. That's, that's part of love and being in the family. But if anybody else does, I think in a way, maybe Jesus is hitting at this. He's hitting at who we love the most. This is, this is our family. And so he's coming there and he's, he's coming in this extreme way. He's saying, okay, look. This is your family. This is, this is the, the, uh, the standard you have with your family. Like, nobody's going to come in here and mess with them. And you, and you love him this way. And so he comes in and he's like, if you don't hate your family, if, if, if you love them more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And it's like, wow, he, he's coming in there. He's clear about what he's saying there. He's not being wishy-washy here. He's saying, he's not saying, okay, I've said this before. Like, he's saying, he's not saying, okay, here's your family up there, and, and here's where Jesus is. It's like, okay, Jesus, he's a pretty good guy. I'll, I'll, I'll invite him to my family reunions. You know, we'll, we'll bring him over for family meals. Yeah, he's up there. He's up there with my family. No, he's not saying that. He's saying he's got to be either number one or are we really even following? Like, he is there. He is who, is who we worship. We shouldn't worship our family, you know, in, in any way, in anybody else. Like, he's got to be up there. He is number one. And that's what he's saying. He's challenging our dedication there with him. And I think that's what he's saying here. Put this up on the screen. I, I think this is what I would ask you. Are you in like with Jesus, or is it your whole life? Are you in like with Jesus? And that may not even be uh, Right, how you say that sentence, but I just want you to understand, are you in like with Jesus? Is he just, do you just like him? Is he just okay with him? Or is he your whole life? That's what he's asking from us. That, that's what he's saying. He's demanding us, like, w w that's what I'm saying. We have to come to that type of decision. We're not here just like, uh, he's okay, um, you know, I like this sometimes, I like him okay, I, I'll bring him in there when I have some really tough problems. It's like, is he absolutely number one in our life? I think we deal with, I, I think we need to deal with that. And we have a tough time as Christians and as people attempting to follow Christ. There, there's people in this world, it, this may not be as, as something as relevant to us, like it, here, it's, I've said it before, and we know it, it's a lot easier to start to follow Christ here in this world. We, we don't have as much opposition. Now, now maybe you do, maybe your, your family's unique in some way, but it's not as much opposition as in some places, or some, some of the people in the Bible like dealt with. There are some people who, this is, this is, a, this is a huge decision, this is like huge ramifications for somebody turning to know Christ, like turning to live for him. This is just something that's really big. To some of us, maybe that's not that big of a deal. Maybe you're just there one day and you're like, you know what? I mean, my family would love me. Yeah, they, they would love me to do this. So it's not a big thing. I'm just kind of examining this, Kyle. I'm just trying to see if I want to do this. But there are some people that it's like it, they, they're essentially choosing Christ or, or their family. You know, if they turn to Christ, it's, they don't want to, but this is what will happen. Their family will completely throw them off. And some of them, it's even further than that. It's like, I, I'm choosing Jesus and then I die. So, so it's either over here, like, I can stay alive and, and live and everything's going to be okay, and I just won't be killed, or I turn to Christ, and 
I'm either going to be running from a life or I, I know I've just signed my death warrant right there. Like that, that's, there are people that are that way in this world. So maybe that's easier for some of them to understand that. This is a really tough decision. Are you in like with Jesus? So some people, I think it's, it's tough for them to, to try and figure this out or try to understand this. So with that type of an understanding, Jesus told his guys, you and I, and whomever would, would turn to follow Christ, he said this, like up front, he's being very clear, it will not always be easy. It, it's going to be tough to follow Christ. So that's what he's saying. So we've we got we to gotta wrestle with that. Now, I'll get to, like, if, there's good parts in this. I'm not just trying to, like, throw it out there and it's evil and it's hard and it's really tough. Like, go on your way, you know, tough day or whatever. We'll get into some of that. But I want you to understand he is very clear on this. He, he's not being, you know, kind of mysterious about this. He says it's going to be tough. Follow me. I, let me read some more passages here. This is it's actually still in Matthew. Matthew 10, 22, just kind of going back a little bit. He just says clearly there. I just want you to see what he's saying. You'll be hated by everyone because of me. You know, it's like he's not, at this point, he's not worried about feelings and all this, but he just said, this is what's going to happen. You'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. He said this so often, talking to his guys and talking to people. And, and I think I used to, maybe early on in ministry, kind of leave some of these things out because it's like I don't want anybody to you know, to be scared off from some of this stuff. But this is what he's saying. I, I don't want you to, like, you, you, we can't go out and, like, bring people in and tell them all the nice stuff. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be great. And then slam the door on them, like, suckers, it's going to be tough, man. You know, and just, like, just like, switch them in that way. We, we shouldn't do that. We need to be up front. Because Christ was. He wants us to have this deep faith, like, like trust. Like, things are going to happen to you, and I want you to know that so that when it does, you turn to me and, and nothing else. You'll be hated by everyone. It's a, it's a really tough thing. He says, full disclosure. So, so maybe some people coming in are like, wow, like, why in the world would I do this? This seems so tough. Like, turning to him, my, my, my world's going to be turned upside down. My, my life could be on the line. Like, people could leave me. This is really tough. And I would just say, because it's everything. Turning to Christ, you do not have life. That's what I'm saying. This isn't just like some social club. I'm, you know, hey, come in here. You know, you may be killed, but hey, it's, it's good people. You can be around or whatever. It's everything. You come to know Christ, you have life. You don't have him. You don't have life. That's what I, I think maybe this helps us understand the, the, the true nature of this. Turning to him is when we have real life. When we don't have him, we don't have life. And so it is. He's trying to be up front with this saying that you need this. You, 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 need, you need to turn to me to have real life. That's what he's saying there. I, I want to read a, another passage here in a second. This is in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. So turn there. We'll, we'll read a, kind of a big chunk there. 1 Peter chapter 4. So speaking of suffering and, and, and evil, we, we look at that. We, we hear the tough things that's, that's happening here, but, but where does that come into play? I know I talked about it. I know he said it's going to happen, but really, what is all this about? So I want to read this. Remember, Peter had been with Jesus. He'd been there. Christ had told him, like, okay, all these things. He, he did ministry with them. They saw the things that he did, but then he was up front with them, and he told them these things. And then now they've gone out. It's like at the beginning, you know, uh, you, you see Peter and just uh, uh, he's going to do all these things. He's kind of putting his foot in his mouth and a lot of times, and he, and he denied Christ at one point, but his, his faith was strengthened through all this, and he was told the truth. And now he's out there. Look what he says. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So again, I think he's kind of pointing out like, hey, look, Jesus, Jesus said this was going to happen. This is tough. We, we know this. I, I, I don't think I fully comprehend what all he's talking about there, but this is what he's saying. He says, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or of any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. Man, just, you hear what he's saying there. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it, begin, if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard to be righteous, for the righteous to be saved... What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Man, just, just the words of a, of a changed man who, who's, who's lived through all this. And in fact, we don't see this in the Bible, but according to history, and some of you probably know this, according to history, Peter was crucified, but he didn't feel worthy enough to be crucified in the same way Christ was. So he asked to be crucified upside down. This is a guy whose life was 
completely rocked, completely changed, and I think he believed this. Same way as Paul we talked about last week in the past couple of weeks. Like, I, I think, I believe it because I see his life change, and I see how he lived and how he just died eventually, and his words that he had, and he was just willing to live for God no matter what. So think about this. I'll put this up on the screen. Suffering is not a way to be saved. You know, I don't want to make you think that, but it's a byproduct, I guess is a way to say that, of a truly devoted life. So it, what I'm saying, it's like you don't do this. We don't go out there and like, like start whipping yourself, whatever, to be saved. It's like, I need to be saved. You know, don't do that. You'll just have whip marks on your back. Don't do that. But it, it, it's, it's kind of like, it's like the, the, the same idea of works. You're not saved by works, but it should just naturally follow someone who follows Christ. And, and so suffering, again, maybe that's not as fun. We think about works as good, but it's like sometimes living for Christ, this isn't something I can say this is what all is going to happen to you, but it's like he, he did say up front with this, he said some stuff's going to happen because people hate me. So if you link up with me, people are going to, are going to see you and they're going to hate you because of my word, and it happens. We may not see it as much here, uh, you know, over here, and, and maybe you've seen more, but again, we may just see, like, insults and separation in social clubs or whatever, but there is going to be some separation, persecution, temptation, trials, whatever's going to come at us just because of having faith in Christ. And, and if you're fully in with him, it, it's going to be tougher in that way. Uh, let me quote this. This is a, a guy by the name of Tertullian. He was uh, from the, like, Late 100s, 200s, I mean, way back. He was in, you know, in the early church, just a theologian, um, uh, apologist and all this. But, and let, me, let me quote this. I don't have this up on the screen, but this is what he said in some of his writings. Because he's living in a, obviously a different time, but just stuff was happening. The church was being persecuted just in a crazy way um, before there was a little bit of uh, uh, rest after this. But this is what he said. He said, we're not... We're not a new philosophy, but a divine revelation. That's why you can't just exterminate us. He's, he's speaking about Christians there. He says, the more you kill, the more we are. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You've probably heard that quote, maybe. You praise those who endured pain and death, so long as they aren't Christians. Your cruelties merely prove our innocence of the crime you charge against us, and you frustrate your purpose, because those who see us die, uh, those who see us die wonder why we do, for we die like the men you revere, not like slaves or criminals. And when they find out, they join us. Let me say this. From here, as I'm talking about this, as I'm speaking about suffering, and I mentioned it a minute ago, I don't want to in any way put some kind of weird thought in our minds, like some unhealthy uh, like pursuit of suffering and pain. It's not saying we pursue that. Like, we try, like don't go up to you. Like, I can tell you how to do this. You can go up to some, like, roid crazy guy at the gym, you know, and just, like, your mama is so fat, you know, and just, like, wait for the punch or something. If you want this pain to come at you, you can do that. That'll happen. That won't get you any closer to God. I just want to let you know, save you some pain right there and, and some concussions and stuff. Like, it, we shouldn't pursue this, but it's just saying, like, this happens on us. He's more just kind of warning us, like, okay, when you follow me, this is what's going to happen. Satan's going to attack you. People are going to come at you because this message is controversial. The, the message of Christ saying he is the only way is tough. If we speak it the truth, you know, it's, it's tough. It, it divides. It's the truth. It's, it's life, but not everybody wants to hear it, and, and it gets, it gets kind of tough. So, so I'm, not I'm not telling you to go out there and, like, pursue this. I'm just saying, like, it, it, it can happen, and that's what he's, I think that's what, what he's trying to say. Now, Tertullian, you know, just think about it in the early church. There were these events they would have really at the Colosseum, and, and they would bring in Christians. I mean, this is just brutal. It's just horrible. They'd bring in these Christians, and they would put them there, and, and just they would let these lions in there just to massacre these and kill these, brutally murder all these Christians. And it was just that the, you know, the Christians went in there, and this was a show. People just paid to go in there, and they watched this, and they cheered it on. And I can't imagine just the evil. It just must have seemed to permeate the whole place like as they just watch the Christians just be brutally murdered. Now what he's talking about there in this, and I've read some of his other writings, what he's mentioning is he's like, okay, this was happening. Christians were, were, were being brutally murdered and eaten by lions. I just can't even imagine that. You know, I, I just, I can't imagine what was happening there. But he said there was something, there was something that, that some people, not everybody, there was people still just cheering it on and wanting all this to happen, you know, wanting more people to come. But there were some, maybe in the middle of that, who were, were just normally, you know, kind of cheering this on, seeing it, but it did something to them. They're, they're seeing some of these Christians, like, 
what, why are they this, why are they, they seem to have some type of peace or there's some type of hope or something. That's what I get from his writings and what he's talking about. There's something different about it. They're being brutally murdered. I can't imagine what I would do in there. And they're, they're not acting the exact same way that I think they would before they were killed. This is, this is, there's something different about them. Who are they following again? And I think that's what he's saying. It's like there was something different they saw in them. And because of it, he was saying some people actually turned. Because of this brutal attack, all these things come at them and they're killed. And they were, their, they were the show for everybody, but it impacted some people. And I've read other stories where there were some people that the Christians were there and they were fixing to be just brutally murdered and killed by them. And, and others around were seeing this and they volunteered. I don't, know, I don't know why you get to that point. I don't know why you can't just later say, I'm going to follow them, but I don't want to volunteer here. But they actually did. They volunteered like there's something different. And they went with them, offered to be killed with them because it, was, it was something about they could just feel the presence of God inside of them and it impacted people. And so I think Tertullian is saying that. He's like, okay, you may kill us, you may murder us, there's going to be blood and all this stuff. But you cannot stop the church. What God is going to do, it's going to go, in fact, like this is actually just growing it even more because other people, you're killing us and you're brutally murdering us, but other people, it's impacting on some way. They're seeing this, what you intended for bad. God's using it for good. And that just draws me back to Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember his brother sold him into slavery like a horrible thing. And then later on, he's like second in command in Egypt. Go read that story in Genesis at the end. It's that long story. And at the end, he's like, he sees his brothers, you know, the whole story. I won't go through all that. But then he's like, they're like, we're, we messed up. We're sorry. And he's like, hey, what you guys intended for, for wrong, for evil, and us, God intended for the good. God had plans through this. And I see that through that. And I see that kind of in the words of Tertullian there. He's just saying, God, God's still going to grow this. The, the church cannot be stopped. Maybe we need to hear that today because I, I think we, we talk about the church like it's dying and all these things, and it's not going to die. God's church, there's no way it's going to die. I just want to encourage you with that. But I see that. This, man, what a cool thing. And so I, I want to read that again from First Peter. You don't have to put it up on the screen, but I just want to read those passages again in light of that. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed, when he comes back, you know. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. You know, that's, that's the type of stuff like... You know, maybe, maybe it's easier for us to get goosebumps and excitement here. Like, yeah, I mean, that's exciting. In the middle of it, I know it's really tough. But he, he works through that. I want us to really understand that he, he, he can work through those different type of things. Man, what a really cool thing. Just, just to see that and see how they are. So if you are in Christ, he says you will go through things. You, you, you will suffer. There will be temptations. There will be trials and all these things. I, I don't know what they are, but I, I've, I've said this many times to people, and I say, this is just me. I see this from Scripture. This is what I kind of draw out of it. It's like if, if we're never, ever tempted, if we're never, ever have any kind of temptations, any, tempted in any way, like or just tested for our faith, I, I honestly do. I question whether are we really living for him? Are we really doing what he wants? Maybe, maybe we're saved, but I'm saying, you know what? There can be very weak uh, disobedient Christians. You know, I just being honest here, it's like, if we're not being tested in some way for our faith, because you know what, if we're not stepping out there in faith and following him, are we really living for him truly and deeply? I, I know that's, that's kind of my words. I, I get that from scripture, like it should happen in some way. Again, I don't want to push you. Don't go after the Roy guy, but it's something I think that should happen. And maybe the question comes to us is, am I w really living for Christ? Like James chapter one, man, just that, just that first chapter. I really love it. I think it can go for every week, really, that we come into the church. It just talks about uh, tests and temptation, all these things, trials, like it comes to us and it helps us grow. It helps us to have perseverance and all that. I think we need to understand. It. Maybe we should just go back to that chapter every week and just read that and remind ourselves in the morning just to get up in the day, like it's going to be tough, but God can do stuff through this. God can do stuff through me. That's what I really want us to get there. Church and people, I'm, I'm telling you that in complete honesty, uh, that it grows us 
when we go through stuff, when you go through trials and temptations. That, that's something you may be tempted. All of us are. I've been tempted like not to pray as bold because I'm like, I know what happens if you truly are following God. He's going to answer sometimes. Like if you go to God and ask God, give me boldness, give me tests and temptations. God, I want to do that. Uh, don't be surprised if he says, okay, I'm going to do this, and he'll do that. Sometimes we don't want to pray as bold like that because we're afraid of going through those things. But, but, but there's, a, there's a point to those things. There's a reason. He, he grows us, and he does things, and people see through us. It, people, people can be impacted through us. You, you know, I, I've never, uh, I can't completely relate with some of the guys in, in, in the Bible. You know, I've never been put in prison for my faith. I've never been, you know, had lions come at me, you know, to try to kill me or been put in there for like some show. You know, I've never even fought a mountain lion like the Colorado runner, you know, or whatever the other day, what it, which turned out to be a cub or something, as somebody said. But I've never, you know, had something like that happen, you know, in any way. But, but stuff really does happen. Stuff, temptations, trials, like people just come at us. And it's, it's hard just sometimes living in our society to fully live in for God because you have all these temptations coming at us to quit, to soften up on our stance and what we believe and, and, and soften up on taking our message out to people because we just don't want those awkward conversations. It, it's just, it's hard sometimes to live that way. There's a purpose in our suffering. We grow. He, he can... He can persevere us. I you know, always, always talk about like there, there's those valleys. You, you get down there and it's tough, but then you, you fall up there and you, and you just start living for him and he brings you to a higher place and you're stronger than ever. He does that. But it also, like I said, with Tertullian and what he was saying about those guys, it also impacts other people. So it's not even just about us. That's what's cool about God. He's like, I don't know, the ultimate multitasker or whatever. Like, we have pain. We have all this suffering, and it happens to us. And he's like, I want to grow you through this, but I'm also doing something over here with this person that you have no idea about. Or all these people that you, or maybe you think this person is being impacted, but it's this person, you know, like all these different areas. Like, they're seeing this, and it's impacting them in some type of way. So all the things that we go through, it, it, it's for a reason. I, I hate that some of us have to go through stuff. I hate that my wife has to go through so, so much with her health issues and stuff. I mean, it's just, it's really tough, all the things she goes through. But I was even talking to her about this yesterday, trying to be like a good husband and a pastor. I get to give messages and stuff, talk to her. And I was just like, man, it, it just, it impacts other people. I know it does me just to see, and I know other of you that go through health issues, but that's just what I see with her. And it's like, I know it impacts other people just to see you know, your strength and, and your faith in God, and it does. I've seen all the places that we've been, just people that are just impacting that way. And, and in the same type of way, it's like what we go through as Christians, it does impact other people. So there's a, there's a purpose in that. There's a purpose in some of the things we go through. We're in a time, I, I think maybe it's, it's always been in time in, in Christianity. We're in a time when, when people are, are, are examining church, they... they come to churches, they check it out, and they're looking at it, and so often, this isn't all the places, but sometimes they'll see, they'll see the hypocrisy, and the same cheating, the same lying, the same stuff that goes on in the world, they'll see it sometimes in the church, and and it impacts them, and and, and they turn away, and they're just like, this is why I don't ever go to church, this is why I don't want to be there, and and, and at church, I'm just, I'm calling, it's like, let's take this, this living for God seriously, because it's not just us. It's, it's impacting others. It's impacting others' eternal lives. Like, like just their decisions. Are, am I going to turn to God or not? It impacts so many other people. It's more than just us. It's more than just, just getting a group together and feeling good about ourselves. It, it's more than just us. It affects other people. And so that's what I want us to, to remember about that. Other people are seeing this. So there's suffering and there's pain in the world. The, the world needs to see us living this way and, and living truthfully for God. Suffering will end. Evil is in the world. We know that all around us. Is there a purpose for some of this? There's a purpose. He's doing things through this. It's not always going to be, and the reason I can say that, I can say that confidently, is like there will not always be suffering. There will not always be evil. It, it, it's, it's hard. It's tough, and I can say that confidently. But I'm going to read this, this last verse here, Romans 8, 28. Maybe you know this by heart. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And that was the verses we had some of the kids memorize. It's like, I want you to get that. 
all these things. That, that's tough. I think it's tough for us sometimes as Christians to, to get that and to, to memorize it or maybe just believe it. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So believers, I, I'm telling you, that's what he's saying. This is the God who cannot lie, who doesn't lie, who's telling us the truth. He's saying, I'm doing a whole lot of stuff behind the scenes that you don't know. There's things that happen. I know that. I'm not oblivious to it. There are stuff happening in your life. It's tough. It's difficult. But I, I can work these things around for good. And I'm doing things in your life, but I'm doing things in these other people's life. I'm trying to draw to me. And, and maybe, just to answer a question here at the very end, maybe to give you some hope here, like with evil and with suffering in the world, this is the question that comes up to lot. It's like, why is it still happening? Why, why doesn't he crush us? Why doesn't God just deal with this right now? I know he can do it. If God is so great, why doesn't he destroy all this stuff right now? Why doesn't he do this? There's pain. There's people that are suffering in this world. Just, man, they're, 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 they're great people. Why are they going through all this? Why is this happening? When is he going to do this? He, he says he destroys all this. We see him doing these miracles. Kyle, why doesn't he destroy all this now? And, and just my answer to you now, and just in, in a simple way, is like his grace. I know it seems like a weird answer, but it's just in his grace. And I don't have this passage up there, but it's 2 Peter 3.9. It just tells us that God is not on our timetable. And he's patient, doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everybody to come to repentance. And I want you to remember that because it is hard. There is suffering, there is evil, there's all this stuff going on around us. And I know, I'm with all of us here, it's like I cannot wait to be in heaven. That is actually going to happen, okay? We're going to be in heaven, all that stuff's going to be wiped out. Perfection will be there. It's not now. I mean, it's, it's easy. You, you could see me up here. And like, perfection is not, as a pastor, like, you know. I, I can't even explain what I'm trying to say here. Pointing, example, right? I can't even talk right. Uh, I'm not perfect. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I should just end right there. It will be one day wiped out. But because of the grace of God, because of his love, because he wants other people to come to know him because he wants as many who will to come to him. That's what, he's, that, that's what I see, and that's what he's saying. Because of his grace, because of his love, he doesn't want anybody to perish, but all to come to repentance. He wants everybody. So that's why I'm saying, like, church, let's go tell the world. Let's go out there, and let's get everybody to know about this. And because of his grace, he's saying, I, I've got this timetable. I know when I'm going to end all this, but it's not right now. You just keep going. We just continue to keep going. And, and I always say this. I think about this. Maybe individually we think about this. I'm glad that God didn't bring us all back when I was like 18 because I, came, I gave my life to Christ at 19. It's like, because I would not be in heaven. So if you think about that, it's like, well, we wouldn't just to wipe it all out, but there's people out there who don't know him, people out there that maybe at some point are going to give their life to Christ. Man, that, I hope that drives us and breaks our hearts and pushes us out there to take this message to the whole world. There is suffering. There is pain. God does stuff through that. It will happen, but man, this is a short life, and then we're off to eternity. Church, we got a huge job. we got a huge job to go out there. And that question really kind of still remains. I'll just end it with that. Are you willing to follow Jesus even if it costs you everything? Because that's what he's asking from us. That's what he's saying. He says, I want, I want everything from you. That's tough. I know. I know up front. I know what I'm saying here, but he says, are you willing to follow me even if it costs you everything? That's what he's asking from us.